Turner Network Television proudly presents the 1986 Goodwill Games from Moscow and from Madrid. Brought to you by Pepsi. When it comes to taste and refreshment, time after time, it's Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. By Budweiser, Beechwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. And by CNN, the world's most important network and a proud sponsor of the Goodwill Games. And now, here is the host of the 1986 Goodwill Games. From Moscow, Bob Neal. The symbols of the athletic anticipation of the Goodwill Games have now turned in to pictures of reality. As you see displayed around our studios here, we have photos from the opening ceremonies through so many of the wonderful events that have happened so far. We're in day 11 of Goodwill Games 1986. Welcome to the Late Night Show. Uh, as the announcer just said, I'm Bob Neal and Paul Horning is joined with me. And Paul will be our guest on the Late Night Show tonight. We have a lot of activity for you. First of all, we're going to be going back to figure skating. Champion Brian Boitano will be opening our program of figure skating from the Lennon Stadium Sports Palace. We'll also be featuring the Arthur Johnson boxing match that Paul had called earlier today, and he'll preview that for us and set it up. It's an exciting bout indeed. Yachting coverage from Tallinn Bay, also tennis from uh, Tallinn Bay. The U.S. women are doing very well. They're into the semis now, and we'll tell you about that and show you some action from tennis a little bit later. So we have an action-packed program on Late Night. Stay with us. Paul Horning will join me in just a moment from Moscow. Goodwill Games Boxing is heading into the semifinals now, and you've heard the voice of Paul Horning throughout our coverage of boxing, and Paul has joined us once again on our Late Night Report. First of all, I'm going to ask you about the boxing, but the first thing I really want to know about <laughs> is you and Skip Carey and your coverage. Do you have any Skip Carey stories you want to, want well, to share Well, I tell you, us? I think the biggest chance that Bob Wester took about these games was putting Skip Carey and I together and, and <laughs> chancing letting us alone Here in Moscow. watching you know, the boxing. But anyway, he <laughs> had the good wisdom, of course, to put Don Chevrier with us also. So at least he's got one person there that knows something about boxing. Uh -huh. But anyway, I've had a great time working with both gentlemen. And Skip, of course, is outrageous. And, uh, and he continues to be outrageous, more so off the boxing venue than on. So I've enjoyed it. So you've had a good time, but there are no stories you can really share. No, is that really. There's, there's a few I'd like to tell you, but I, well, I think we better not. <laughs> Let's talk about the boxing a little bit. First of all, Michael Bent, we saw on our prime time coverage tonight, surprisingly lost uh, to Belay uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, what are your, your thoughts about that and Michael Bent's losing? I was, I was surprised. Well, first of all, before the boxing started, Michael Bent was our best hope for a gold. At least uh, that's what uh, Roosevelt Sanders, the boxing coach, had told us. Michael Bent, of course, probably one of the best best amateur boxers in the United States, and he is. He won his first bout, he was into the semis, and uh, last night he got stopped by a very, very good Soviet good. boxer. Uh, he, in fact, he won the first round, Bob, but we thought he won the first round handily. In fact, he stopped the Russian for an eight count, a standing eight count in the first round, and then the second, he kind of Looked felt like, that he was taking it easy. Yeah, it looked like he faded toward the end of the second round because the, the Soviet boxer landed some punches like the last 10 seconds. And then, of course, uh, in the third round, it was all the Russian. And Vladimir Balai uh, moved on to the finals against his teammate, Sibiev. Now, we're going to have that for, on Saturday night. That will be a great heavyweight fight. And this is uh, very important for the Soviets. Mm -hmm. They want to win, uh, and you, when you got two Soviets in the ring so far before the semis, they just kind of move around, and you know, it, it's your own teammate, how do you go? It's just like practicing. You're yeah. not, it's hard to really go out all out against a teammate, but when it's for the gold, and when it's for the championship, that's going to be a great heavyweight fight, and we'll no. bring it to you. Okay, another question I have, and that is that Harvey Richards of the United yes. States uh, was disqualified for a low blow, and what's the latest on that? Well, we keep getting vague reports about it. it. It's all mixed up. First of all, he shouldn't have been disqualified because the Dane was willing to go on. He was okay. It was a low blow. He hit him uh, below the belt, doubled him up. But although I really had a feeling when it happened, Bob, that the Dane was behind, number one. Mm -hmm. He was way behind. It was uh, middle way through the second round. And you know when something like that happens, so you hit, 
you're going to act it out a little bit more. And he really hit the, uh, hit the uh, canvas and took his time getting up. But then he was ready to go. Now, the rules say if you're ready to go, you know, you must take a point away from the boxer, but continue on. Mm -hmm. If you cannot, if you're not ready to go, it's a disqualification. What the referee did, he disqualified Harvey Richards on, on the spot when the Dane was ready to go. And the rules say that you can't do that. Well, the referee has been suspended from any further work. That's news. Work. We didn't, weren't aware of that. Right. The referee has been suspended from any further work uh, in the tournament. So now they have to form a... Uh, they have to write a formal request, mm -hmm. and that has been done. But like Leslie King of the uh, Boxing Association says, it's a big odds that it'll ever be overturned. Probably is going to be disqualified, as they said. Right. All right, now as we look down the road uh, with the boxing, as you look ahead, who are the, the, the top couple or three possibles for a medal, gold medal even, for the, for the United States? Well, first of all, we still have 10 uh, U.S. fighters left. I think the best, of course, Arthur Johnson, you're going to see a great fight tonight. Arthur Johnson from East St. Louis, Illinois, is the quickest boxer we've seen in all the 116 contestants that they have in boxing. He has the quickest hands. He has a perfect style for international boxing. He scores lands a lot, a lot of, of points, of lands a lot of punches, and his combinations are quick. His combination, he'll, he'll uh, use seven or eight, uh, he'll get in seven or eight hits in one combination, so he's very, very quick. Michael Moore has been absolutely uh, sensational. He, he had a knockout in the first round. Uh, the coach also is very, very high on him. He says he's a tremendous inside puncher, and he just came up with a little left hook and, and put his, uh, a gentleman from Tanzania just right on the canvas. Completely knocked out. It's the only knockout in the first round that we've seen. So Michael Moore has a great shot. Uh, Bernard Price has a good shot. Mm -hmm. We still have 10 guys left going into the semis, and possibly we could have... Uh, Maybe three know, gold medals, possibly? Yeah, three gold. I think uh, Roosevelt Realistic. Sanders would be very happy with three gold medals. I'm hoping for more, of course. Remember the first night you were on with us, I asked you how much you enjoyed swimming. Remember your answer to that? You oh, said, absolutely. You yeah. said something like swimming, yes. Yeah, well, it's tough. Uh, how about figure skating? Figure skating, uh, I tell you, I just talked to my wife back in Louisville, Kentucky. She wouldn't miss figure skating. She loves it, and I do, too. I really do. I like, I like the grace and the athletic ability of figure skating. I know Peggy Fleming... Uh, is here. I haven't seen any of the figure skating yet. It was the toughest ticket in town. Hot ticket. I mean, uh, I don't know how many people were there, but I know I've had uh, at least 100 requests from people in the hotel. Can if you, you can't ticket? get a ticket, if you can't get That's a ticket, right. you can't get a ticket. Absolutely. <laughs> in just a moment, Angela, don't turn the dial because <laughs> Brian Boitano is going to be figure skating. Uh, we'd like to invite everybody else in North America to watch too when we continue right here from Moscow. Here's the number one men's figure skater in the world, Brian Botano. Won the Nationals of the United States this year and the World Championship. And he's going to do a hoedown in the rodeo. Brian's 22, lives in Sunnyvale, California. Good. Began skating in 1972 after he saw an ice volley show. Linda Lever, who's coached him for 14 years. He became the first person in the world to complete all six different triple jumps in a single program. Here's, Amazing athletic ability. Here's a, a triple lot. He is like a machine. He is so consistent in his technique and his jumps is just excellent. champion, Ryan Batano. His ultimate goal is to win the gold medal at Calgary in 1988. That's what he's shooting for. He is just a phenomenal skater. I mean, the talent in doing his spins and jumps and it's just nice technique. He enjoys bicycling because the sport employs the same muscles as crossovers on the ice. Mm-hmm. 
first time in front of a Soviet audience. The world champion, Ryan Patano. He's 22. Debbie Thomas is 19. I say we've got a couple of great young skaters there. They for train. The they train very close together, about five miles apart. Debbie trains in uh, Redwood City, and he trains in Belmont, which is very close. I skate at some of the rinks once in a while and see them there. Mm -hmm. understood that move. <laughs> little drink at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Tie the horse up. Hello, Padna. <laughs> we can't get more American than a cowboy, huh? Number one in the world this year in men's figure skating, Ryan Bacano. Well, he certainly deserves it. I was over in Geneva when he won the Worlds, and it was very exciting. He had tough competition from a Canadian boy, uh, Brian Orser, who also is one of the other people that does a triple axle jump, which Brian is very famous for, that he, more consistently than any of the boys, uh, can e execute it in competition when the pressure's on. He says that if he wins the gold medal in Calgary, that he'll retire. Well, it was, um, it, the Olympics is, is really what all the skaters really strive for, and um, he has a very good chance of, of uh, getting that goal. Here he comes for an encore with Oklahoma Crude by Henry Mancini. to this music. That's right. You can feel it, Kurt. <laughs> and my Oklahoma wife sitting up in the stands here. Well, you came into the rehearsal the other day with your cowboy hat on. Looked like you parked your horse outside. <laughs> I had more fun with my western hat that I fish in than the Soviet policemen and military. It's supposed to be so grim, and I'd doff it to them. They'd all sort of smile and clap their hand. <laughs> I liked it. I put it on a couple of them. Well, it looks good on you. There's Brian Botano. Wear it well. Number one men's figure skater. Coming out for another bow. 
as the Soviets have appreciated him. And the other skaters are plotting too, the Soviets. Two, three split jumps. Traveling camels to a back sit. Great. <laughs> This is so nice, this event, because of the uh, skaters just doing exhibition. This is a wonderful time for the skaters to really get to know each other in a relaxed environment. The pressure is off. You know, it's early in the morning in Moscow, even though it's uh, late in the evening in the eastern time zone of North America. And Paul very Horning, early. very early. <laughs> and Paul Horning, of course, I always thought had the limo. But I understand there's a rumor floating about a Steak and O TBS Sports Studios that you came over in an actual real people's employee's Absolutely. van. Absolutely. We go back and forth in the vans every morning, every day. And I think if we had a limo, I think Skip Carey would kill me if I had a limo. <laughs> We're going to move along to the boxing. Earlier, Paul told you about the Arthur Johnson fight and how good it was. Paul called it earlier tonight. We're going to join Paul and Don Chevrier right now for the Arthur Johnson boxing match. This could be one of the better matchups of these Goodwill games, the boxing competition. It is the flyweight semifinal. Arthur Johnson, a human buzzsaw who uses both hands so quickly, so effectively, Paul Horning, against David Greenman, a world championship medalist out of Venezuela who's been very impressive also in his two Oh, it could be a, a good match, and Arthur Johnson has really been impressive. He has the quickest hands of all the 116 fighters we've seen. I tell you, he really looks good. His combinations are good. His, his punches are quick. And he wastes no time putting things in motion as he lunged out there with a wild shot at Greeman, who uh, beat an Irishman and then won a close decision, almost too close, in his quarterfinal bout. Johnson, though, just breezed past uh, these two world medalists in the World Championships in Reno, Rodriguez of Brazil and Verratti of Hungary, with amazing style and aplomb. He is uh, an outstanding athlete, 20 years old, from East St. Louis, Illinois. And uh, he has been accused of letting up in the past. Mm -hmm. That but cost him a medal in the World Championships against a Turkish fighter, but not here. Not here. He's continued on with these flurries all the way through the three minutes. David Greenman, on the other hand, the flyweight, 19 years old, 5'6". South American champ. Won a silver at the World Championships in Reno. That was the competition where uh, Johnson was crushed by his 3-2 defeat in the first round by the Turkish fighter Ayub Khan. He was in tears and later vowed that he would come back and make amends here at the Goodwill Games. And so far, so good for Johnson, the loser of this bout, and it promised to be a tough one, good left hand thrown there. Uh, we'll get a bronze medal no matter what, but they're fighting for more than that. They're fighting for gold to stay alive for Saturday's final. Johnson has an unload of the flurry of combination punches uh, that we saw in his last bout, but he's showing more respect for this young man. But he's got the perfect style for international competition. He's got quick hands. He throws a lot of punches, and he just, and when he's on, he knows it. He puts on it. He's got a little flair about him. And he's a hard hitter, too. He's not just powder puff punches with the, with the quickness. He gets something behind them. Over a minute to go in the first round. It is scheduled for three here in the Olympic Sports Complex in Moscow. Greenman looks totally unfazed by what Johnson's throwing at him. Keeps on coming. Not the slowest hands in the world either, but that as quick as Johnson. No, sir. Nobody's taking charge yet. Greenman has good technique. He's very well coached. He's still a teenager. Good left. Has a left throw that did connect. Start to feed each other out here. Become a little more confident. <laughs> Tough first round of score for the five ringside judges. 30 seconds left. Freeman not uh, backing up one bit away from Johnson. Staying with him. Johnson definitely the aggressor. The official from the Soviet Union, Lovedius, throws away the uh, sash that they used to identify the fighters 
From the red corner, it is David Greenan. Good exchange. hook by Greenman at the end of that. A good exchange by Johnson, but uh, he got hooked to the end of the left hand of the Venezuelan boxer. He has a tendency to drop his hands a lot. You see his hands? Johnson's hands are down, and that is what Roosevelt Sanders, a boxing coach, must always contend with. Both wild at the bell for round one. Round two, boxing semifinal here at the Goodwill Games. Not a great first round for Arthur Johnson. He fought on Friday and on Sunday, as David Greenman of Venezuela did, and he looks the more tired of the two. Not quite as crisp as he was, certainly, in his second bout in winning the quarterfinals on Sunday. As you see Greenman up on his toes, moving, 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 and Arthur Johnson, as you say, Don, does not look as quick. I think he may have lost that first round. by a slim margin, 20 to 19, 20-point must system to the winners. S 2018 would be a very one-sided round. It was not that. Could have gone either way. You never know how those judges are going to score it, but Johnson's certainly not as active or as accurate as he had been previously. And Gr Greenman keeps his hands moving quite rapidly, too. He, he hits a lot inside. Uses that left hook to advantage as well. Throws it there, comes up a little bit short with it. Johnson may be a little bit confused by this style as Greenman is up on his toes, moving at him, digs the left of the body, missed the following right hand to Johnson. Freeman, at this stage, taking charge in the second round, past the one-minute mark. Johnson with his long arms having trouble getting to him. Tries to set him up in the corner now. He goes to the body. Freeman shows he can be a pretty good counterpuncher as well as he dances smartly out of there. the first fighter who has moved well against Johnson. We've seen. And that can make a difference. Past the halfway mark of the second round, the halfway mark in this bout. Arthur Johnson has got his hands full. Oh, I got There's a good. right. Good combination there, a left and then a right. He comes back in and he scores and he scored with another right. Now he's opening up a jab by Greenman. But that was the best exchange by Johnson in this entire bout so far. He's got that sneaky left hook he likes to throw at you. Show you the right. The left comes out as a jab now. And falls short. Less than a minute to go in the second round. Jab, jab. Two scoring blows by Johnson. The white area anywhere from the belt to the head. And he's got to continue to stay busy now. The scoring zone, but he is more busy certainly than he was in the first round. And the Soviet people sitting in uh, relative silence watching this. It's the Red Army there, coach. A lot of servicemen, of course, all around. You see them all over Moscow, and they love the boxing here. There's a lot up in the balcony, a lot of big crowd here for this card as we're at the uh, semifinal stage, heading for the medals here in Moscow. Johnson, who's had to dig hard in this round, throws a combination, takes a left finishing hook from uh, Greenman there on the ropes. 20 seconds to go on the round. A couple of well-matched amateur boxers looking for the lion's share of the medals. Freeman, a picture of confidence against the flashy Johnson. It was a right then a left to Johnson, who looked more impressive earlier in this round than right now at the finish. The bell for round two. The third round is underway in Moscow. David Greenman of Venezuela, in my estimation, has an edge over Arthur Johnson of the United States, certainly in the first round and maybe too close to call in the second round. But the bottom line, Paul Horning, is that he's going to have to work here very hard in this third round. This, I think this is the decisive round. I, uh, maybe I might be a little bit prejudiced, of course, but I think Johnson may have won the second round slightly. Well, I'm not so sure. Nope. Well, that's close then, right? <laughs> yeah, I, well, the bottom line, as we say, is he's got to turn it on here in this round, but he's fighting a very tough opponent in David Greenman, who has world championship experience, the bronze medal from the World Games in Reno. And Johnson started a bit more slowly in this bout, but is coming on now in this third round more effectively. He was so impressive against the Hungarian in his last fight. Fast hands, flying like windmills. But now he tries to go inside and establish that left hook of his, which could be so effective. Now fires out the jab, but doesn't use the following right. They're at the one-minute mark of round three, and not a bad round for Johnson. He's keeping Greenman at bay a little more, but now Greenman does bear in on him. Greenman going to the body. Wants to keep it inside if he can. Johnson with the long arms, pushing it back, trying to get a good shot, and does. Combination out there, but Greenman just keeps on coming. He sure does. He's forcing the action. 
Freeman's got him in the corner. And Freeman with the edge in this third round as well. Johnson's got half the round, a minute and a half left, and that's about all to make an impression. Minute 24, and Johnson's got to get busy now. Freeman, he's got him on the road. away from the scoring. David Greenman putting on quite a show here. Greenman coming forward and Johnson is backing up and you can't do much when you're behind on the bout and you're backing up at the same time. He changed his tactics. He was on the defensive in the first round. He let Arthur Johnson come to him and scored at will then. Now in the third round, he's just keeps coming forward. He's the, he's on the offense. Yeah, he's wearing him down. Freeman is putting on a marvelous display here in this third round. Round that Johnson had to come up big in, and so far has not. He has fought decently, but not brilliantly in this third round. And until this round, the fight was very, very close. Now it seems to be swinging very much in the Venezuelans' favor. One hundred and thirty seconds to go. They both go at it hard inside, giving it all they've got for this crowd here in Moscow on the Olympic Sports. Venue. Johnson looks very tired. Freeman continues to come at it. Just five seconds to go on the rod. It's been a good one. A very good one, it would seem, for David Greenman of Venezuela. It'll go to the ringside judges for their decision. Portions of the 1986 Goodwill Games have been brought to you by Pepsi. When it comes to taste and refreshment, time after time, it's Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. All right, we're looking at the replay of the conclusion of round three awaiting the decision, Paul. Uh, what, were, what were your thoughts about this prior? And now you see that Arthur Johnson has won the 3-2 decision. Well, he won a 3-2 decision, and the referee, of course, does not take part in the decision. But the 3-2 means that three out of the five judges of the fight felt that Arthur Johnson was the winner, and uh, it was very, very close. I thought that David Greenman won it in the last round. I thought he came on in the last round. But here we get a break. So uh, we'll take it, and uh, Arthur Johnson moves on to the finals. He's already in the finals. He's the first American boxer into the finals against a Russian, Bilgis. Uh, he will fight, uh, how do you pronounce his first name? Uh, oh, it's a good one, Rin yeah. Vidas. Rin Bilgis. Vidas Bilgis in the finals Vidas. Saturday night, and this will be an excellent fight. Great. We're going to go check in on the yachting now. Too bad you and I aren't up in Tallinn Bay with... Ted Turner and Gary Jobson in coverage of the racing up there. They're in day four. It's a seven-class race. Let's go for coverage now to Gary Jobson. Yesterday, American board sailor Mike Gebhardt showed his determination by coming from behind to beat his Soviet rival after trailing for the entire race. He was tired, and a good dunk in the water cooled him off. Today, Gebhardt prepared for his fourth race, and he looked ready. Kathy Steele of Annapolis, Maryland practices nearly every day and has captured the hearts of the locals here in Tallinn. So far, she has a first, a second, and a third in the women's board sailing division. Sisters Karen and Gail Johnson have dominated the women's 470 class with three straight firsts. And in the Finn class, Soviet Oleg Kupursky has won three straight races, and his margins of victory are getting bigger every day. Perhaps sailors could breathe the wind easier if they had this view of the Baltic Sea. Welcome back to Tallinn, Estonia, for the fourth race of the Goodwill Games. And for the first time in five days, the sun is shining. So it should be a good day, although right now the breezes are light while the boats tune up. After three races, it's clear that the Americans have a chance of winning a medal in each of the nine classes, but also each American boat has had at least one bad race, so the final result is still in question. After three disappointing finishes in the Americans 470 class, Americans PZ Herndon and Cindy Goff were hungry for a victory today. After some fancy footwork maneuvering for the start, the U.S. team to the left emerged from the pack and went right to the head of the class. A 
nice start for a team that's been slow so far in the series. At the second mark, the Americans led as they jived their spinnaker in winds of only six knots. At the fourth mark, it was clear that Herndon and McGough had gained confidence. They snapped their boat around the mark. This maneuver is called a roll tack, and they went on for an easy victory. Cindy, Peasy, great race, really nice job. You've been telling us in the first few days that you've had some trouble with your boat speed, but today you won by a giant margin. What was the difference today? We like the flat water a lot better. We go a lot better in that kind of breeze. Just both of us sitting on the rail, flat water. Cindy, do you find it a little frustrating in light air, or do you like it like this? I find that I concentrate a lot better in light air, probably more than other crews. So I, I just key in and really get psyched. You've got a a fifth, which will be your throw out, I assume, two thirds and a first. So how do you feel with three races to go? Do you still feel there's hope for the gold? I don't know, it depends on what the next three days are like. Uh, Karen and Gail have quite a point spread right now, so we have to wait and see what happens. We'd like to get by the Soviet for the second. <laughs> well, nice going today. Thank you very much. American collegiate champion Morgan Reeser and his crew Kevin Burnham won their first 470 race yesterday but found themselves buried in the pack after their start today. At the second mark, Brazil was in fourth, in spite of some sloppy sail handling and light air. They were followed by Australia, the boys from down under. The Americans used every puff of wind to their advantage. At the fourth mark, they only had three boats ahead of them. Then in the biggest turnaround of the games, this American duo hit high gear and won the race. They now lead the series. Yowza! Close finish for fourth. Hungary on the right. Canada on the left. Canada tacks away. Hungary goes right after them. They want to get to the finish line. The Canadians tack once more. They roll the boat hard. Hungary not to be outdone. Tacks to leeward. We've got one boat length to go. The Canadians shoot up and take the race by a nose. Great stuff. Morgan Reeser, great come from behind victory. How did you do it? Uh, well, we fell behind pretty quick right after the start. All the people on one side of us passed us with a big wind shift. And we just kind of waited and waited and waited until we got a little to one side of them. And then just played the shifts on that side and passed them on the last leg. Two firsts in the last two races. You're going to be able to keep it up now with three more races to go? We sure hope so. It's yeah. getting better and better. <laughs> Americans John Kostecki, Bob Billingham, and Will Bayless won their third race in the soling class today in light winds on a course that was shortened at the end of the fourth leg. They're seen here struggling to fill their chute in light winds. Watching all this action has been my old sailing mate, Ted Turner, who's been a great friend of the yachting community here in Tallinn. It was a good day as the American 470 and Soling Sailors won their races. The United States is leading in three of the nine yachting classes. Remember, there are basically seven classes, but there are also two separate classes for women, even though women also yacht alongside men and the others. So that's why we say nine. The U.S. is leading in three, and they're second in three other classes, three more days of competition, and we'll be bringing you coverage from Tallinn Bay. Now we're going to go back up in the same general direction of the Soviet Union. This time we are going to go to Yermola. That's the location for tennis. It's women's singles today, and here's Barbara Estep. The women tennis players from the United States have scored a major coup at the Goodwill Games in Yermola. As a team, they were considered the third best entry here, behind the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia. However, when the umpire calls play to begin the final match, it'll be two Americans facing off. Beverly Bowes, receiving here in the far court, has a forehand that some of the women here will be seeing in their nightmares, including the very talented Svetlana Parhomenko of the Soviet Union. 
Гейм. И первый сет Боуз со счетом 6-1. That return gave Bose the first set 6-1 in her semifinal match. Beverly, a senior at the University of Texas, was seated fifth in this event, but her form and determination speak well for the U.S. Collegiate Athletic Program. In the second game of the second set, Parhamenko serving once more, and this is typical of the long points that two good clay quarters can orchestrate. Bose needed every ounce of concentration she could muster because only about an hour earlier she had finished her quarterfinal match, a really draining affair, 7-6 in the third. Out. That was a pivotal point, and Bose broke to go up three love. Parhamenko fought back valiantly, but once again found herself 1-5 down, Bose serving for the match. Svetlana is a very stylish player with some impressive wins to her credit, but on this day, she was simply getting blown out by a young lady whose first goal is to finish college. Caroline Kuhlman from the University of Southern California on your right pulled off a stunning upset of the tournament's top seed in the semifinals. Receiving here, Kuhlman demonstrates her good court coverage and an excellent attacking game, winning the first set 6-2. Her opponent, Larissa Sevchenko, the Soviet number one, came back to play inspired tennis in the second set. Sevchenko plays regularly on the international circuit and she's well known for her touch. A la this drop shot. And she evened the match at one set all, taking the second 6-3. But in a tightly fought third set, Kuhlman broke serve at 4-5 to win the match, 6-2, 3-6, 6-4, and earn her spot in tomorrow's final against Beverly Bowes. Paul Horning's with us, and we'll be back to chat a little bit more about boxing and other items in the Goodwill Games. But right now, we're going to go back to one more event in the beautiful figure skating that's going on at the Lennon Stadium Sports Palace. And let's go now to Peggy Fleming along with Kurt Gowdy. Now you're in for a treat. This is a, an unusual encore here. <laughs> Wanda Beasel from Wanda Mary Beasel. Figure Skating Club. The person she credits to inspiring her to skate is a, a comedian, Werner Grobley of, of Frickin' Frack. She has a wonderful sense of humor. I think she's got bubble gum in her mouth. Yes, she does. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. <laughs> now she's ready. The and saber now. dance. <laughs> Comedy routine. Of course, the toe turn. Oh, a little trouble on that little tap jump there. Footwork. You know. She'll get it. A little more practice. <laughs> She's having fun. She can chew gum and skate at the same time. <laughs> Split jump needs a little more work, a little more speed, maybe would help. Sit spin needs a little help too. <laughs> but she's happy with it. <laughs> Nothing like a little arm movement. On a spiral. Oh, the extension. Oh, whoops. Oh, she got a little hung up on the extension. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Had a little fight with the bang boards there. <laughs> Backstroking always adds a lot to a program. The spread eagle. You think the Soviet crowd really knows what she's doing? I'm not quite receipt. sure. <laughs> I'm not either. But Debbie has a wonderful sense of humor. Slip there, <laughs> but that didn't stop her. Having a good time. 
Debbie Thomas, the women's world figure skater, putting on a little comedy routine is how not to win a world championship. Right. Well, you had to start somewhere, you know? <laughs> Now the Soviets are warming up. Oh. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think they, I think they got the message. Yeah, they finally got the message. <laughs> oh, great costume. Great costume. <laughs> what a sense of humor this girl has. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> ah, great. Debbie <laughs> Thomas, number one in the world. Oh. Get rid of her bubble gum and collects mm -hmm. the roses, and the crowd loves it. You know, uh, Peggy, I was doing a marathon, and you hear the thing, the Soviets never smile. They were laughing and smiling all along the route of the marathon, and here they are tonight. Look at them smiling and laughing. They, <laughs> they like it. She's catching her breath. Is that her coach with her? Uh, no, that's not. That's Howard Silby, and he's with here at the Goodwill Games oh, with yeah. the team. She's coming out again. Listen. They're even the saying crowd. more, more <laughs> in English. Now the comedy routine won their hearts. <laughs> serious about the skating. Oh, dear. The ballet. <laughs> but she's happy. Her facial expressions are adorable. Isn't it? Bidding her goodbye. Whoa. <laughs> oh, dear. There she goes. And again the hand. Big splash. The Debbie Thomas. <laughs> Those are moves we all have nightmares about doing in real serious numbers. Yeah, you'll be hearing from her in the Nationals in 87 and then the Olympics in 1988. Hope you enjoyed the figure skating. We'll have much more of that again tomorrow, so you'll be sure and be tuned for that. I want to just have just a second to go to our phrase of the day in Russian, Paul. Oh, I can't and this wait for fits, that. This fits your lifestyle when you play. The phrase is, listen carefully, folks, Povtorenia Mats Uchenia. Pofterenia Mats Uchenia, and Paul Horning would have said it a different way, but it's repetition is the mother of learning. Now, when you were playing ball, what might you have said? You want me to say it? Could you see if you can you see? Practice, practice, <laughs> practice. Uh, he set me up to that, folks. I would say Papreski, Papreski, Papreski. Very good. Look what it got you for that. One quick question before we go away. First, thanks for being here with us again on the Late Night Show. Uh, any any feelings about boxing that you could set up? You mentioned a couple of guys. Uh, somebody mentioned Bernard Price may be a good one to look for. Price is going to be on Thursday night in the semis. Arthur Johnson already in the finals for um, uh, Saturday. Michael Moore is got a great, great shot for him. Absolutely. Paul, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again shortly. Good thanks for here. joining us for our late night coverage from Moscow. Speaking for Paul Honig, this is Bob Neal. Das Badania.